Kia ora, kia ora, kia ora, uh, kia koutou e are are mai ana uh, i tēnei wā. Um, really, really excited about this next episode. I'm sitting across from a bit of a legend in the game, I must say. Uh, someone whose face and voice may be familiar uh, to you. Uh, te hāmua, no mai ki tēnei whare wānanga, bro. Tēnā koe te tuakana, kei te mihi. Ia uh, koutou e mātaki ana, tēnā koutou. Man, I do feel you are a bit of a legend in terms of whether it's presenting, um, being a personality, and even being around you over these last few days, that's not even something that you need a camera for or mic, it's just your personality and the way that you are. And mm. is that something that you feel has been a part of you for a long time in terms of just being more outgoing, flamboyant in ways? It's um, it's hard case, eh? Because I think everybody has legend in them <laughs> if they grow up to be what they were always meant to be. Um, I did a post on Facebook just this morning about hanging out with the likes of Fiddy Muckle Black, Till Mika Perkins, uh, Kevy Keys, yourself, <laughs> Dai and Mark Kopua. You know, these legends, Tina Ngata, <laughs> uh, who are just living what they were always meant to do. So their wairua is doing what it was always determined and destined to do. And I think that's me. When I was a kid, um, I was always after the attention in class at school. <laughs> so that class clown sort of um, vibe. Mm. Um, I always wondered how come the teachers are allowed to talk if I'm getting told to shut up. Um, and, and then I grew as the son of a preacher man. So watching my dad rock a crowd pull out his guitar and just put the icing on the cake. It was like, whoa. Mm. So I'm very much um, lucky to have grown up under my old man, um, Uncle Derek Lardelli, <laughs> Uncle Wayne Ngata, um, Koka Queenie Moiho Reedy, um, all of these rangatira of the East Coast who saw in me, everybody else saw a mischief fella who just wanted to be their centre of attention. Mm. But when I was 21, my mum told me about my Māori name, Te Ha Mua. Uh, and my uncles told me that that's what they saw in me as a kid, the breath out the front, yeah. to be out the front and putting out the first, the first, which was like, because uh, I was given the name Shane when I was born. Well, My mum was too scared to give me a Maori name that was gifted to me while I was in her puku. And when I was 21, she said, oh, geez, you're Maori. So here's your name. And I was like, oh, man, that makes so much sense, you know. <laughs> so I feel um, to be called a legend um, can sometimes be a little bit shyness in, in you know, oh, geez. But nah, not for me, because I think everybody has that in them if they're doing what they always were meant to do. That's a cool way of looking at it, you know, rather than being in that sense of being whakama, if you know that it exists in others, of course it exists within you, yep. and it takes away the sense of ego or yep. being... Um, you know, the tall poppy syndrome, whatever might happen. And so I really like that narrative and the way that you've been able to frame it and the kōrero around your name being Te Ha Mua, mm. and that was the characteristics mm. of you as a young fella. Mm. Do you feel that there is significance in people's names and how they actually align to the path that they're on? I grew up in a place called Poverty Bay mm. that used to be called Tūranganui a Kiwa. The place where Kiwa stayed for a long, long time in a time when our ancestors didn't stay in a place for a long, long time mm. unless it was full of resources. <laughs> Captain Cook came, killed two of my tipuna, asked, uh, can you fellas please give us some food and water for our boat? And the auntie said, brah, come on, man. Look what you just did. You killed not only our two meanest kaiwero, but one of them was the tender of the garden. He was the Kumara man. Mm. You killed the Kumara man and you want us to give you kai. No. So he said in his books, this place afforded me not one thing that I asked for. They are impoverished. We will name this Poverty Bay. You look at Poverty Bay now, Tūranganui Akiwa, under that shadow, mm. unemployment, mental health issues, violence, everything that a rangatira doesn't do has happened to my hometown because somebody changed their name. When little Shane was growing up, um, I was just recently telling somebody that when I was little, kids used to sing to me, Shane, Shane, the shit stain, Shane, Shane. Now I didn't even know what a shit was because my dad was a pastor. We didn't have that word in my yeah. house. So I'd be singing, yeah, they wrote a song <laughs> about me. Then when my mum told me, you know, he, he, he Māori koe, and I'm like, 
man, I've been doing te reo Māori since I was five and kapahaka all through high school. What do you mean? Mm. And it broke her heart. She told me with tears in her eyes, this is your name. This is the story behind your name. Go and be your name. My mum passed away in 1999. The last thing she said to me before she died was, please use that name. My middle name is Brisbane, which is my father's middle name. Don't lose your father's name. You can do whatever you want with Shane. He was my favourite singer. I was so sweet <laughs> ears. Um, so I, I, I used Te Hamua, Shane, Brisbane, Nikore as my name. And people freak out. They go, what the hell? Where did mm. Shane come from? Brisbane? What's going on there? <laughs> and that's a, um, that's a World War One or Two name. One of my tipuna fought for Australia. Actually caught the Spanish flu on the way to the war. Was sent back died and buried in Brisbane. Uh, he then had a nephew who was who was named after him, his first name Charles, middle name Brisbane, because that's where he's buried. Mm. Passed to my father, Charles Brisbane, passed to me, Shane Brisbane. Uh, and I was ashamed of that name, I was at the bloody Australia, until one of my uncles told me that story. The power of a name, once you have the understanding, mm. it's no longer something that I'm whakama of. Um, and I shouldn't be whakama anyway, you know. Yeah. But... Uh, I, I now have pride in that name because it's a rangatira name. But the name Te Hamua fits like a jacket. It was bought <laughs> for me. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's cool to hear the, I guess, different kōrero that come from these names or these things of meaning. Mm. And the kōrero around being proud, mm. the sense of acceptance of oneself is mm. so important for mm. self-esteem confidence and just how we want to walk into spaces or be around people and obviously that was something that you have had the majority of your life or all of your life and you work a lot with rangatahi is that a message that you share to rangatahi around things like that i love rangatahi um i still feel like rangatahi myself i'm 50 years old just turned 50 in july <laughs> but i have a rangatahi heart I, I like to show them more than tell them that it's easier just to be themselves mm. than to be what they think other people need them to be. To be. That's what I did growing up. I watched and, oh, okay, these people need me to be that, so I'll be that. Um, I'm no longer a church person and I have nothing. Well, I do have a little bit, but I'm not here to blast the church, but I grew up in the church doing things that was expected of me as a pastor's son. Mm. Um, the reasons I did them, I like lunch, I don't like hidings. Hmm. And that was not the reason to do them. So now w when I got away from that, I was able to be myself and then love my parents as my parents rather than my pastor and my pastor's wife. Yeah. Um, when you're being genuinely yourself. Now, if your genuine self is a hotutu like I was, if you have a bit of Maui in you, be that. But you also have to learn how to be that without blasting it everywhere and, and getting in other people's way, you have to be able to learn how to do it in a constructive manner. Mm. And that's what I show rather than tell rangatahi. Um, you know, just that's my sort of leadership is, oh, well, I've done all of that before. Just follow me. That's the way that I was taught by the tohunga that taught me. Just watch us, boy. Yeah. I was three years exactly. old when I was put on the pai pai at uh, Pohorawuri because it, all the cousins were playing bull rush. And I was getting smashed. And the old fellas felt sorry for me. Come here, boy. Sit between us and just watch us. Now mm. I'm a fai kōrero man. Wow. Yeah. It's cool to, I guess, see that it's around being an example because rangatahi are more around action. Eh? They're more observant than they are in terms of being told because they've been told what to do their whole lives. And yep. usually yep. what you're being told is you're looking at the person telling you and you're seeing things that contradict what's been said. Mm. <laughs> and so it's mm. more so that practice and mm. being an example. And for you around, you know, being on a pie at that young age and, you know, did you always have te reo, bro? Or was it, you know, particularly with your upbringing or did that come a little bit this later? This is a hard case story, bro. Uh, we, um, I was born in Wellington. My parents were living in Johnsonville. Then my little sister was born while we were in Johnsonville. Ten months later, my mum was hapu again with twins. So we moved to Titahi Bay to have more room, bigger house. And my mum and dad had always wanted to come back to the coast, mm. both coasties. So they got transferred to Ruatoria. I was four years old. Um, four and a half, about to turn five in July. And my parents 
put me on this bus stop. The bus stop was right outside our house, a bus that took us, took me to some school. And it turned out that that some school was uh, Te Kurao Hiru Harama. At that time, practicing Kura Kaupapa Kohanga Reo styles, oh. way before it was even cool. Some of the East Coast nannies had gone over to Ireland a few years before to have a look at the language nests that were happening over there. Mm. And what I was told was they brought it back to Hiru Harama, which is sort of like the Taitanga Mate um, Hiru Harama Marae sort of area, that hapu. And they said, well, we're going to practice on these kids. If it's no good, that's all right. We only messed up about 40 kids. <laughs> if it's okay, we'll, we'll see if we can spread it out across the country. So I had the real by the time I was five. Wow. Um, my first language speaking was English because that's what we spoke at home. Mm. But my first language understanding as a language was te reo Māori. Mm -hmm. So I say my first language is te reo Māori. Mm -hmm. Speaking it since I was five, we then moved into Gizzi. The old man got a uh, transfer as a Ministry of Transport cop into Gizzi. Um, I went to a Pākehā school, which I thought was called Mangapapa, because that's what they called it. I yeah. uh, found out that actually that's that language that you used to speak at your other school. And I'm oh, Mangapapa, no Mangapapa. <laughs> so we had wow. one language we spoke at home, another language we spoke at school. Mm. And then I went to a Pākehā school and was speaking home language, mischief for the rest of my school career. Mm. Because of that cultural yeah. shock, yeah. Gisborne Intermediate, I met Peter Moyo from Waihirere. He had the Māori club going there, so I jumped in there. Gisborne Boys High School, Derek Lardelli, wow. over, over. My uncle found me and two of my mates. Um, we're a crew called the Three Blind Rats, Henare <laughs> Tahuri, uh, Arapeta Patrick Takoko, and he split his knowledge between the three of us. Wow. And I'm um, really, really blessed. I, I, I hold my uncle up there as one of the reasons – you know, he knew I was mischief. He knew mm. I had a big mouth. He knew all the teachers didn't like me, and he loved that. Yeah, <laughs> so he grabbed it, he sneered it, yeah, yeah, and then he directed it. So I thrive on mischief young fellas yeah. that have been told not to their whole lives, and I say, go, my bro, go. Because that's relatability, eh? Because what you're seeing is you're seeing, you're seeing energy being dispersed, and when you're in a space where you can learn how to either harness it or control it and direct it, that's where I'm seeing your story play out in your own, but also how you support rangatahi or others go yep. through it because you see yourself in the mate yep. and you just need someone with guidance perhaps. And, yep. you know, you had some real pokey, um during that time mm. and now you're that for others. Mm. And one of the posts that I saw recently on Facebook that you spoke about was around Nati. And can you speak a little bit about that, yeah, bro? Yeah, so Ngāti Pro. Ngāti Pro are known as uh, He We We Ngāti. Mm. Um, and I, I made that post in particular because I know a lot of our people that didn't grow up at home, Ngāti Pro is all over the world. Mm. And they call themselves Ngāti with the G. Yeah. They're like, yeah, I'm proud, I'm Ngāti. Mm. And, well, Ngāti is every Māori, right? <laughs> Ngāti something. He We We Ngāti is a kōrero from I think it's Taipira Nangata, might have actually been before him, talking about the t um, the tufts of grass that grow along the coast and hold the erosion back. Mm. Um, they are stubborn, they are strong, they're only little, but you put heaps of them together and they hold erosion back. And that's what we are as a people. Mm. E we, we, Nazi, no Porourangi. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to bring that out to let our people know we have a little horse bred on the East Coast called Te Hoiho Nazi. It's got little legs, it's stocky ears, but if you take that, a male of that, and breed it with a female from like those Arabian countries, yeah. mean horses, hey. mean horses. <laughs> so, you know, you take a Nazi and you breed, breed them with whoever you want. <laughs> It'll turn out better. Right? some magic babies. <laughs> some magic babies. <laughs> <laughs> a big thing around um, Ngāti Parau, there's a lot of marae that are named after wahine. Yep. And so what is the significance with wahine within te tairawhiti and how is that? Because it's real significant mm. in comparison to other iwi. Mm. So what's the kōrero around that? Uh, we have a, a, a whakatauki in Tūranga in particular, Tūranga Amua, Tūranga Ararau, Tūranga Makaurau, Tūranga Tangata, Tūranga Tangata Rite, Tūranga Wahine, Tūranga Tāne, Tūranga Tangata Rite. Mm. So talking about... Um, uh, Tūranga, the place that pushes forward of a hundred pathways 
of where everybody is equal. Mm. So basically in Ngati Pro, and this is probably very pre-colonial because we've softened a little bit by colonization, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't matter who you were, you were sitting on the pie if you knew how to do that. Mm. You were doing the wero if you knew how to do that. You were cooking the kai if you knew how to do that. If that's what the tohu upon you at birth was, mm. that's you. Mm. doesn't matter what you got in your undies. Around here, we need you to do what you were destined to do. Mm. Um, as I say, it's very rare to see a woman in Ngāti Pro now speak on the pie. Mm. Hopefully one day that's going to come back, because I remember when I was a kid, Fire McClutchy used really to sit on well. the pie, and if she was told, you know, hey, get out, you're a bloody woman, she would do things like some of the legendary Ngāti Pro and Whānau Apanui Kuia from back in the day would lift their skirt up, over their head and say, this is where you come from. <laughs> Don't tell me what I'm allowed to do. Yeah, For I was brought up by my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother, all three of them imparting wahine tanga into me. Mm. They knew I was born male, so I'm already going to be male. Mm. We need you to know how wahine think, mm -hmm. particularly wahine in leadership. My nan made all the decisions. Mm. My grandfather thought he did. <laughs> and so did we until we got old enough to sit with her and realize, okay, this is the lady that's running our whānau. Mm. And we have no problem with that. My grandfather, no problem with that mm. whatsoever. Um, he mana nui tō te wahine o te mm. And even now you have this ingrained, sometimes accidental mana wahine that Ngāti Pro women have, mm. ones that have grown up in Africa, for example, mm. really powerful women, but they don't know why. They don't mm. know that that's what is around here. Mm. Or you get the ones that grew up in Aotearoa, away from the coast, hearing that powerful women, oh, okay, so I must have to be grumpy. So mm. wherever they are, they're grumpy on everyone. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted people, when my nanny was still alive, come and watch my nanny be powerful, loving and kind, yeah. all at the same time. My cousin Tina Ngata, mm. kai te pira, mm. kai te pira. She's a rangatira, but she's not grumpy about it. No. She's a leader, but she's not bossy about it. Mm. She does enough for you to go, oh, I'm following that. <laughs> yeah. And for me as a Ngāti Pro man, if I have a Ngāti Pro woman leading the way, I'm safe. <laughs> That's beautiful to hear. Just going to dabble back into uh, the space where, you know, the majority of people that know of you have seen you it's within the production space within mm. media mm. and how did you get into that what was the pathway for you to get into media and broadcasting and doing and after university so i did um te tohu paitahi, well the first year anyway oh, at um, cool. waikato university went into the second year where they split us up so first year was nine till three reo maori anake 30 people in your class all day long mm. and i loved it mm. Second year, they split us up and spread us out over the university to do our other papers. I hated that. Mm. So I found Hidden in Melbourne's class and just stayed there all day <laughs> until he came up to me and goes, boy, um, you got other papers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, much of but they're dumb. I'm just going to stay here. He goes, you can't. I'll get in trouble. And I said, not if you don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't do that. So I ended up going home back to Gizzy. Um, uh from there, we started, so I ended up teaching the first year of Te, te Tohu Paitahi mm -hmm. at the Polytech. Then we went to Kura Reo, the first Kura Reo that was started by the Tauraferi. Started going to those, once again, um, Uncle Wayne Ngata was our tutor. He points out this kuia and he says, go over there to their kuia, tell her who your grandfather is. I said, which one? And he goes, John Shields, your, your mother's father. Mm -hmm. My grandfather always told me that he was nobody when we were growing up. Nobody, don't know anything, that mm. my nan's the boss, have no idea. Mm. I went to talk to this queer. I told her, he moko puna hau na John Shields. She looked at me, big, big glow in her eyes, and karur her nephew's moko puna. This was nan ni mate mm. kaiwai, daughter of Se Apirana Ngata. And from then on, Kura Reo for me at Tauraferi was a totally different experience. Hey. I didn't have to go to class. I was kick out with my nanny. They stroked the Maui tanga in me because yeah. they knew that I'd pop in, in and out of all the classes and inject it with the dopiness that I'm now known for mm. as actually a rangatira type thing that I do. Yeah. Back then it was just mischief, but these old people, they knew. I went from there. Uh, I met a, a, a wahine who was teaching at um, Hwani Waititi. Mm-hmm. 
sort of fell in love with a little while and her bosses were like, oh, man, we need a teacher. Come and teach over there. <laughs> so I taught at Hawaii Waititi in 1997. Wow. End of 97, I got into radio at Rui Amai, which was the Māori, the real Māori arm of my FM at the time. Right. Um, started off doing a sports show. Um, the producer soon figured out I know nothing about sports. <laughs> and that fellow that I was interviewing was actually just my own self with a different voice. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I almost, almost got the sack, bro. <laughs> Henare Pryor was my boss at the time. You know, the, the great Pryor, all black Māori, all black yeah. funny. Coming, what the who? The, you're talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so they put me on to a rangatahi show, myself and Amo Mai Pihama, a uh, show called Ka Hau Te Rangatahi. Mm. And from there, uh, Potaka Maipi, who's the father of Hana Rafati, was um was one of the bros at the time, and he'd mm. shot down to audition for what he thought was a news TV show, a new one. Come back like white as a as a ghost. <laughs> bro, it's for Tamariki, bro. I oh, know nothing about Tamariki, but I told him I know this fellow who loves kids. <laughs> oh yeah, who's that? You. So he took <laughs> me down. I auditioned. They already had their four presenters. They yeah. were set, ready to go for two Mickey, mm. which became Pukana. The but, boss comes out and she's like pulling your hair out. She says, "Who are you?" I need you. I've got no more money. We've run out. I've already got my four presenters. What can we do? I was sweet. This sounds like fun. I'll do it for nothing. Whoa. I did my first year um, for 7000 bucks. I think. Whoa, I right. bought myself a car for my first year on TV. And and that's where I walked in and I found myself. Yeah. I, I was able to be Te Hamua. Um Shane, I used to keep on the shelf. Shane's mum had actually just died. Mm. We were burying my mum the first day I was supposed to be uh, hooking up with the two meke, which mm. became Pukana crew. Um, yeah. And lots of battles went between Shane and Te Hamua, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, all of that sort of thing. Yeah. We've come to a point now where Shane and Te Hamua are cool. Wow. They can roll together. Um, some people call me Shane, some people call me Te Hamua, some people jump between the two. Mm. Depending on what you call me, I know how you know me. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Mm. And what's the what was that industry like at that time? You know, there's the how you said it's exciting, yeah. it's new. Yeah. You know, because media then to what it is now, it felt like it had a lot more prestige to it in a sense. We were sort of we were lucky as Pukana. We had my FM um, um my time mm -hmm. before us, and before them was um, Te Karere and all of that. Right. But we were the ones that took both of those, put them together, and made something else. Mm. So you had te fully reo Māori or for Pākeke. Yeah. My time, pretty much fully reo Pākeha or for Rangatahi Māori. Mm. And we put that together and out came Tumiki and Pukana. <laughs> A couple of years ago, we had our 20-year celebration and um, we were having the party afterwards and all of these old legends that I grew up watching as a kid were getting tiddly <laughs> and cuddling us like, you fellas changed the landscape. You fellas are why we do, like you look at Māori television now, yeah. any television, they're saying kia ora, there's rangatahi doing this, all of mm. that sort of thing. Mm. Um, Māori waiata. So I started rapping in 99 in Te Reo Māori. It's everywhere now. Yeah. And um, some people have said to me, oh, bro, they didn't, they didn't even mihi you. I don't care. <laughs> it's not about that, right? I, yeah. I said I, I had no idea what I was doing. Mm. DLT taught me the godfather of Aotearoa hip hop. Mm. So if anybody did it, DLT did it. Mm. And if you want to mihi anybody, mihi him, because I don't need a mihi. <laughs> I, everywhere well. I go in this country, because of the work that we did, I could walk anywhere in this country and say, hello, I'm hungry. Both, Kai. <laughs> I need course. somewhere to sleep. Both, got a bed. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. so cool. And how have you seen it change, you know, because of that time in the late 90s mm. to now we're in the 2020s yeah. a lot of things have changed we've got facebook we've got you know social media we've got huge there's so many different arms to it that has changed the landscape of media and so what have you noticed in that transition and perhaps there's some great things that come of it I'm a beneficiary of that, mm. but there's also a lot of challenges as mm. well that come with it. And so what are you seeing in that space? Bro? I think for me as a, um, a rangatahi focused person, you know, when we were kids, we were told, oh, you fellas wait till our pōpō, eh? Ko koutou ngā rangatira o our pōpō. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's sweet enough. Fair enough. Wait till I'm old enough. <laughs> now, ko tai mai a our pōpō. Mm. So you've got young people running all of that stuff, designing all of that stuff 
producing all of the coming up, writing all of that stuff, mm-hmm. young people. So I'm like, at my analogy that I always say to the young people is, I want to put you in the driver's seat. I want to put a nanny next to you in the passenger seat, and I'm jumping at the back with the iPhone so that I can play the songs on the radio. <laughs> so I need you to drive. As a young person, I need you to drive, but I need you to know that we're there. The nanny and me are there mm. to keep you safe. Mm. So it's like um, that box that parkers want to put us into. Um, I, I, I don't really like that. Mm. But I understand it. So we, as as a Maori as myself, I have a box that I put people into. Mm. But the sides are very, very, very flexible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I say to young people, push those sides, push them as much as you can. But if I see that you're about to burst it, I'm going to grab you and I'm going to pull you back. Because mm-hmm. if you burst it, there's a there's a lion on the other side who's going to bite you. And when he's finished biting you, he's coming through to bite me too. So if you push it too far and it breaks. I'm going to pull you back. It feels so tempting when you're pushing it, eh? Because you feel Maui, enticed. bro. Yeah. Maui, bro. <laughs> we would be still swimming in the ocean if Maui wasn't mischief. Yeah. There would be no ika for us to live on. Yeah, so wow. I encourage mischief. Mm. I, I used to tour schools, um, speak for an hour, and then say to the teachers, who's the most mischief fellas here? Like the ones that are always on detention. They send mm. me 10 fellas, and for the next year or so, they're angels. Wow. Because I just tell them, I know, what, I know why you're being mischief. And I know why these fellas get frustrated with you. Mm. They call you a little shit, so that's what you be. Mm. But actually, you're a rangatira, my bro. Mm. In fact, you're a atua. Mm-hmm. So the stuff we're, we're doing here, mahi atua, it's not new to me. This mm. is stuff that I've been telling our kids. You get a, like, you, you, you get a, a bull and a cow, and you mate them together, they have calves. Yeah. You get a male atua and a female atua, Make them together and they had us. Yeah. What does that make us? You got the mischievous kids in the school. Like, <laughs> I did one school in particular where the kids used to step the teachers out on their way to their cars and rob them. Far out. Uh, a week after being at that school, the principal rang me and said, I don't know what you said to <laughs> these kids, but they don't do that anymore. Mm. So I, I just said, You're a rangatira, not a shithead. Yeah. So they stopped being shitheads. Man, that's so cool, bro, just in terms of the positive reinforcement, but it's also the truth they, you know, that's the truth that's penetrating yep. a sense of their own whakaro about themselves. Yep. And it's the awakening of the understanding that if this fella's seeing it in me, mm. maybe I can believe him and not myself. Mm. And I Because like, that's what happened to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's that sense sometimes we, more often than not, we do wait for someone to see something in us that we don't see with see ourselves yeah and that's our role as with the we are whānau members mentors in the space of even creating content we just don't know what kind of influence we can have but if we're speaking in that kind of way yeah it does have an effect eh? I, I it comes back to me so we were brought up with kāre te kūmara e mm. reka, which is wonderful. You know, you don't go around telling everyone how sweet you are. Because mm. imagine the kūmara saying, I'm sweet, I'm sweet, <laughs> I'll choice, I'll eat you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, but somebody somewhere took that whakaro and, and killed it, mm. did the wrong thing. Oh, that means shut up. That means children should be seen and not heard. That means get outside, we're trying to watch the rugby. Mm. That means who the hell do you think you are to be amazing? Mm. So I rearrange it and I say, kaore tēnei kūmara e kōrero mō tōku ake reka. Mm. But I will talk about the reka of the kūmara patch that made me who I am today. Yeah. Which is why I always talk about my dad and my mum. I always talk about Sir Derek Lardelli. I always talked about... Dr. Wayne Ngata, I always talk about Auntie Queenie Moiho Reedy. Those are the people, those are the kumara, that's the kumara patch that mm, I come from mm. that made me reka. I'm not the first in my family to be mean at Fai Kōruru. I'm not the first in my family to have beautiful reo. I'm not the first in my family to be able to write amazing songs. Mm. I'm not the first in my family to stand up in front of people and 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 just wow a crowd. I'm not the first. <laughs> I'm mean at it, <laughs> but it's not my sweetness. It's the sweetness. And I say that to rangatahi, mm. and you see this burden lift off their shoulder because oh. they know they're amazing, yeah. but they think they're not allowed to know allowed to. they're amazing. Give them a little rub on the shoulder, push the button, away you go. And they're off being rangatira. Damn, bro, you're making me all amped up over here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> We're at this kaupapa, uh, mahi atua, and, you know, it's been an awesome wānanga, and a part of it is around healing, transformation, mm. self-discovery, mm. using pūrāko to 
draw connection more to self. How has there been throughout your journey, has there been moments of you overcoming adversity or perhaps mamai that you've had to work through? Like mm. what what are some of the things that you've gone through within mm. your journey that mm. makes this kaupapa even more relatable? Huge for me, bro. Um, so I was on a program on TV. I'm, I'm being humble and pretending people may not know. But there was a show called Homai Te Paki Paki mm. that I was the, um, the lead presenter for. Mm. I got a cancer diagnosis. So they found um, testicular cancer in me, chopped mm. it out, found another cancer in my brain, fixed that up. Wow. But I lost my job because I was away from work for too, mm. too long. Um, I then got into um, a, a relationship I maybe should not have got into. I wasn't ready. Mm. Uh, then ended up um, just so many things piled on top of me. I remember looking back now, I remember when my mum died, it was like somebody put, and this is how I explain it to me, people, somebody put the plug in in the bathtub, mm. but as they were walking out of the room, they knocked the tap and it started dripping. Mm. It didn't flood straight away. But 20, you know, 15 years, whatever it was later, I was standing on the side of the road looking for a truck to jump in front of. Whoa. I found my truck um, on Tengai Road in Rotorua when I was living over there. found my truck. I went to step out the front and these babies' faces started flipping up mm. on the grill at the front. The first face I saw was my baby sister, who's now 30 years old, and all of these kids' faces. And I was like, what the heck? Whoa. Jumped in my car. Drove home, did something I probably shouldn't have done, but I bucketed a, a whole ounce of weed because I was so freaky. Now, like, what the heck? When I came down, I wrote a program that I started touring, particularly Kura Kopapa schools, to allow our kids to find a way out of their darkness. Mm. Basically, it feels like you're in a little room and these walls are just caving in on you. All you need to do is look up mm. and see that the room, it doesn't actually have a roof. And that there's somebody up there trying to pull you up. Mm. And that somebody up there was me in this case. And I pulled myself up. My little sister pulled myself up. And then every kura, and this is, this sounds like one of those, oh, whatever spiritual guy. But every kura that I went to, one of those kids' faces on the truck was in the audience. Whoa. And after the talk, I would find that kid and I would say, thank you. Mm. And they look at me like, okay. Like they didn't know what I was thanking yeah. them for, but I'm alive today because of you. Yeah. So I've been through some stuff, bro. Yeah. And then to come to this Mahia Atua stuff and start putting actual explanations to why I did that. There's 70 Atua. You know, some some were bloody always happy, some were always sad, some were crossing in between. And to know that we as humans, as Maori, are sort of like a Swiss army knife with all these Atua mm, to mm. to explain why we do things i was no longer thinking that i was an idiot mm. i was no longer thinking that that you know i was i was worth nothing actually bro that stuff that you say to the kids it's real mm. and i knew it was real mm. i just needed somebody else to tell me that i wasn't being a fairy tale guy yeah. in my own head that's what this um wananga does for me powerful to hear the realness within your story and your core at all mm. and perhaps how it even drives more of what it is that you do share mm. and the impact that you're making in rangatahi and people that you're around because everyone goes through their trials and tribulations in life and it's within those experiences that we do get that intimate connection with ourselves. I mean yeah. you felt like you're in a box and you looked up and it was your hand you know, and that's that intimacy because we learn how to build ourselves back up through the experiences that we go through. And so just want to mihi uh, to that part of your story Jorabai. and to acknowledge that strength that has come from that, but more so the aroha uh, that has grown, I'm sure, from mm. that too. Because mm. when you know you've gone to a point like that, you have empathy, you have compassion, mm. you have more understanding because mm. you know what that feels like. And so I really, again, just want to um, acknowledge that. And what have you noticed within the rangatahi specifically here? You know, because I just saw a young wahine stand up and she just spoke so beautifully and she had this awareness around what was mm. going on and she mm. passed the modi over mm. to someone and the way she mm -hmm. said it was, we didn't speak, but his modi spoke to mm. her. 
Mm. And so what are some of the other key things that mm. you've noticed within the rangatahi here at this Wananga bow? So we're, we're back in the Tairawhiti. Mm. So the rangatahi are no different to the pakeke. Uh The boys will kick back and wait for the girls to make the decision. <laughs> and then they'll go in and shine. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to be able to bring the, the boys up to a bit of a level where they're actually making decisions together. Yep. And that, that might be a long, because, so what happened in Te Ao Māori, um, the Māori Battalion, World War I, World War II, people that were supposed to be rangatira and pai pai sitters and decision makers, men, were sent to war and some didn't come back. Mm. A lot of them didn't come back. Their little brothers had to step up who were never trained to be that. Mm. So we have our, um, generations since then of fellas who are descended from the fella who wasn't supposed to be the fella. Yeah. So they think they're not supposed to be the fella too. I have this in my own, my own family. We don't have very many pai pai sitters in my family. Everybody loves the back, which is cool. Mm. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody's got to have a kai. But... um. I've always been the uh, I've always been the type that will take guidance from the wahine. It was my nanny and my mum. Much respect, but I don't always buy into. Okay, that's absolutely what I have mm. to do. I'll do that, but I'll do it sort of my way because yep. I'm pretty sure I could do it a little bit better. Mm. I just need these young fellas to to realise their power. Mm. So I had um, but there's one little fella and he's cool. <laughs> so I I've got a car that can fit me a passenger and three fellas at the back. One of them's got to be skinny to sit in the middle. Mm. So we were shooting into town yesterday. Boys, I can fit four fellas in my car. So four fellas come over, the littlest fella looks in and he goes, nah, I'm going in the other car. Because he knew that he'd have to sit in the yeah. middle and get squashed. <laughs> and um, most people would look at that and think, oh, ah, Ratchet, he turned yeah. you down. And I'm like, nah, he turned himself up. Yeah. He's like, no, I'm sitting in the middle of these two fat fellas. I'm going in the other car. And that's Rangatira Tanga, my yeah. bro. This little fella is, is seen to be one of those fell through the cracks mm. sort of chaps. But I've been watching him the last couple of days here and he does what he wants to do, mm. the way that he wants to do it, when he does it. And that's <laughs> Rangatira Tanga. Yeah. That's Maui. Maui said to his older brothers, I don't care if you told me to stay in the village, I'm on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to throw Nanny's jawbone out there and I'm getting an island. <laughs> <laughs> but how can how can more of us be more aware of that kind of nature? Because it's not just um it's more so the whether it's teachers, parents, aunties, uncles, we've all been conditioned to be like a teacher, mm. or just to bring more control, mm. you know, to Nanakia in a sense. Mm, mm. And so how can we as um no uncles, whatever, how can we be more supportive within that space? Because mm. yeah, we need to break down our way of looking at kids who we perceive to be naughty yeah. in a way. So this decolonization thing that we're going through as a people at the, at the moment has to involve that. Mm -hmm. when, when Before the Pākehā came, we know the old people would sit around and look at the babies. They did it with me. Oh, look at that one. He can't even tackle. Oh, geez, he got wasted. He doesn't want to play bull rush. Let's put him over here with us. Mm -hmm. Grew me up to be who I am today. We need to look at our, our young people and see the traits mm -hmm. and not see negativity. Wow. I always tell people, if if Maui listened to what he was told, we'd still be swimming around in the ocean. Mm. Bro, this thing on my face is here because in the 1950s and 60s, when the Pākehā said, you cannot do that anymore. It's evil. Mm. The gang whānau went like this mm. and did it anyway. Mm. The man who told me to mihi those people, Sir Derek Lardelli, wow. a moko man that brought me up. Mm. I, I love mischief people, my bro. <laughs> I've had um, government type people come to me. What's your advice around reaching the tamariki mm. of the gang members? Mm. Well, firstly, I'm not a gang member, so why are you asking me for? Yeah. Hey, and if you can't figure out what the next step is, you need a different job. Mm. If you can't figure out that I say I'm not a gang member, don't ask me. So you should go and ask the gang members. <laughs> don't ask, don't ask me about somebody else. Yeah. yeah, I kick with those followers because I'm red, blue, yellow, whatever you are, I'm you. Mm. But I'm not one of those followers. So don't ask me to tell you how to help them. Mm. Ask them. Yeah. Ask them. Man, that's a real wholesome um, way of approaching things, eh? And it's seeing the traits, and that's our responsibility as parents, I'll just speak to parenthood, to look at our children and 
be more aware of how they are expressing themselves yeah. and how can we position them in a way where they can just be that sense of expression rather than what I think he should be. Yep. You know, thinking about my own boys is, yep. I think you should be this. And if you don't fit that, try and make you fit rather than being able to be more flexible and just seeing, yo, that's how you're expressing yourself. Me and my son, yeah, go. Absolutely. Man, that's so cool, bro. Because the way I was brought up, you know, my dad and mum highly in the church. Um, they had leaders above them who would say to my father, your boy is getting too close to that Maori stuff. Mm -hmm. These weren't Maoris telling him that. Old Pākehā followers who knew nothing about what I was getting close to, mm. but they warned my father away from it. So we have the Tamararo Kapahaka competition here in Tūranga Nui Akiwa Tairawhiti. When I was a kid, I was in Tūranga Wahine, Tūranga Tāne, Gizzi Boys and Girls High, mm. and we were smashing every every competition. Sorry, mm. Lytton High School. <laughs> we wasted years every competition. <laughs> and so on the Saturday, I've had moko on my face. Yeah. Then I'd have to go home. My father would give me jiff mm. and a scrubbing brush, uh, and I had to scrub the vivid off my face before I went to church the next day because well, those Pākehās told him that's evil. Mm. I was five years old when I got drawn on the first time. That's Maui's moko, mm. my boy or not. This was at Hiro Harama School in Ruatori. I was like, <laughs> I went home, Dad, this is Maui's moko. Mm. I want to keep it. Get in the bathroom, scrub that off Fuck. with Jif, bro. Yeah, well. And a scrubbing brush. Jif is used for bloody cleaning <laughs> bathtubs. <laughs> yeah. I grew up washing my face safe. with Jif, my bro. <laughs> yeah. Because... Somebody that didn't know us mm. told my father that I was being too much like us. Mm, mm. I come to a die. I come to Uncle Mark, Uncle Derek, Uncle Wayne, uh, Auntie Queenie, and they all tell me to be us yeah. and to be my momo of us, mm. my part of that spectrum. It's a rainbow. Mm. And sometimes you can jump between the colours. Yeah. I'm a jumper. I jump between the colours. I don't always be hood rat. Mm. I don't always be suit and tie. I they all merge into one anyway, yeah, eh? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Ah, that's awesome, bro. You know, another thing that I noticed too is that, you know, your hauora seems to be on track. Mm. Has, there, has there been an intention for yours, bro, to look after your hauora a bit more? Or is that something that you're still in progress with? Still in progress with my bro. But um, having had cancer all mm -hmm. those, those 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, diabetic type 2 for longer than that, um, I... Intentionally, every three months I'm at the doctor because I have to to get mm. my pills rescripted. Every every once a year they do a full body whatever it is mm. they do, and then they let me know how it's all going. I'm like I don't know any of those words, <laughs> but if you're smiling, it must be okay. Yeah. Um, for me, I know that I am more than just a nobody. Mm. I know that I need to stick around. Mm. That's one of the things I learned from not jumping in front of that truck because since then. Um, I've worked at places like the Puhoro STEM Academy and mm. Massey University where I know nothing about science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, but I am a tohunga putai ao Māori. Mm. And I don't actually know that stuff, but I know how to get people into that stuff. Mm. I'm an opener of the door. Yeah. A lot of those young people from 2017 have graduated um, and are bringing real hoariness into <laughs> the science world. And these are kids that grew up in families where Papa decided we're going to be Pākehās from now on because mm. it's safer. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, and then they met me, and they were like, that fella makes much more sense to me <laughs> than what I'm told to be. Yeah. And these are kids, like they, they'll be in their lectures at, at university, Yes, but according to Matua Te Hamua, and then the lecturers are cracking up laughing. <laughs> and these kids are there texting me. This fella just laughed at you, Papa. <laughs> they all laugh at me, my bro. <laughs> but it's, I just encourage us to be us. Yeah. Don't be what they told us to mm. be. Be us. Be who you know. And whatever level you know of us, if, if that's what it should be, but you only know there, be that. Yeah. Don't try and be there because you don't know there yet. Mm. Be that. Because mm. that encourages you to take their next step. Eh? That's right. And man, we've had a long, beautiful, weaved in korero here, uh, my bro, and really bro, I do could do appreciate. this for a few days. <laughs> this is joy. <laughs> yeah, we We're talking about could. my favourite subject. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I will um, pass it over to you. Kia whakakapi ene korero mm. because there is more mahi to do. Mm. Um, but if you have any parting words mm. for our listeners, um, we'll just hand over the rākau kia koe, my bro. Sure. I guess I just really want to reiterate that um, 
You know, everybody was put on the earth or wherever they happened to be for a reason. Uh, my belief is that indigenous people were put on certain parts of the earth by the creator, by whoever you think that is, for reason. We're here in Aotearoa for reason. Um, our indigenous whānau in Australia for reason. Turtle Island for a reason. Those, we were almost wiped out for some other reason, but we are in places where we are meant to be for a reason. Don't worry about the oppressor. Mm. Don't worry. Don't let that get you down. Know what's happening, but just live who you are. Mm. Um, if you as a, a pakeke can be a rangatira and show that to the rangatahi without telling them you better be a bloody rangatira, they'll follow. Mm. And then their kids will follow and the struggle will be because they won't have to. Mm. Wow. It's just personal responsibility within ourself to be ourself and yep. the mana that comes with being connected to our whenua. Yep. As you were having a kōrero, I had a remembrance of a conversation with Te Kuru Jews and you said, we are Māori, we can't go anywhere else. That's right. This is where home is. If this other people, if something happened there, they can go, mm. but we can't. This is home for us. And mm. that was just ringing as you shared mm. that kōrero. So, uh, kia koutou mai te whānau. Um, hope you have enjoyed uh, this kōrero. Um, kia koe te hamua. Really, really uh, know the energy um, of what you bring and the contribution that you're making, the person that you are, the personality that you are, and the difference that you're making in our rangatahi. Um, as you said, ko tērā te kōrero, uh, ko ngā rangatahi, ngā rangatira moa pōpō, hi oi, ko ngā rangatira o inai nei, and you're Sao seeing that, now. you're mm. speaking it, and you can even just see it uh, mm. within the rangatahi and the mm. whareinui. So, kia koe ngā mihi, uh, men to you fellas, the listeners, tēnā koutou. Kia ora, no kute fifi, tēnā koutou. <laughs> kia ora, my bro. Wow. Nice choice. I love this.